sandwiches and had the audacity to ask for his water. He ordered them out as well. We don't need these displays. They're completely different situations. I know you're trying to wind me up, Jock, so I'm not going to bite, but they're completely I would, different. I would never think of that, be Alan, quiet. for they're, a million years. They're completely different situations. Thank you. I've be quiet. Up. I'll sit down. Um, the, the other was a private business and they can do what they want there. This woman is doing her job and it's her right to be able to do her job and it's a message that people in the world and in, in the country, in the world, need to see that a breastfeeding mother or any parent is, is something normal normal and it's human life. How the hell do we think the next generation gets here unless people have babies and feed them? And if her job required her to be in the house at that time doing her work and her baby was hungry, well that's so what? It's nothing new. Jock won't dare to reply to that. Now, no, men, good. But men they're Australians. Shush! We expect men, this sort of nonsense from Australians. Oh, fair point. Okay. Men demand the right to wear uh, skirts. As temperatures soar across Europe, overheated men and boys in the UK and Europe. <laughs> this, this one's all yours, Jock. <laughs> are defying dress codes requiring long trousers. This is actually the bus drivers of Nantes in France, and they are supposed to wear long trousers, so they're not allowed to wear shorts. So they've get a, a, they've, they're getting around that by wearing skirts. Is this a good idea? I wear skirts <laughs> often, and I find them very comfortable, Jock, but I'm not sure I'm the right person to answer. Has Jock, do you, have you ever wanted to be liberated and wear a skirt? He's and... a Scotsman. Uh, no, um, I have worn a kilt, and I hope that um, everyone knows that there is a very, very clear delineation. What is the difference? Well, one is designed to be worn by men, which is a kilt. A skirt is designed to be worn by women. Now, I know that this is something that happened in France. Now, as we know, the French are a funny mob, and they'll wear all sorts of clothing. But I don't know why they can't wear um, shorts. I mean, if they're not allowed to, surely they can have a strike or something, get the union on the... Go and see Mr Marcon or whatever his name is. Look, change the law. Make us wear shorts, which is manly, but not skirts, for goodness sake. The, like, a... the, the Greeks wear little, those little short skirts, don't they, those soldiers? Well, they were pretty successful. Do they successful. want to be like them? They were fairly manly. Yeah. Is it well, a I puzzle? Know, I don't know Jock. about that. Yes. Jock, is it a puzzle that the only men who have consistently worn skirts, the Scots, come from one of the coldest Kilts. climates in the world? Kilts, they're called, Jim. Kilts. Kilts. The, spelling, the spelling is different. I want to ask you about this, something that Jack Ma has said. One of the world's more influential men from Alibaba, he's seen into the future. In a television interview in America, he says the dominance of giant companies like Apple and Amazon is on the decline as more small businesses get exposure with the internet. He also says artificial intelligence could set off World War Three, but humans will win. And more optimistically, we're heading for lives of luxury if we win the war with the machines. I think in the next 30 years, people only work four hours a day and maybe four days a week. My grandfather worked 16 hours a day in the farmland digging. He thinks he's very busy. We work eight hours, five days a week. We think we are very busy. By the next 30 years, people only work four hours. How often have we heard this prediction over the last 40 years? Do you see well, any I'm, sign of this? I'm glad that we are going to win the next war. Um, and if, we have, if we're going to be working four hours a week, then presumably everyone will be on at least five or six hundred dollars an hour. I've got no problem with that. But everyone says this. Uh, I don't think it will happen. It might. There might be some easy times. Nah. Not first, te first technology revolution caused World War One. He said the second World War Two, and this we're in the middle of the third technology revolution. <laughs> uh, Alan Reid, thank you. Thank you. Very Pleasure nice to always. have your refined company on the panel today. <laughs> uh, as always. <laughs> uh, Jock Anderson, thank you for coming in. Yeah, my pleasure. We'll see everybody on Monday and Checkpoint with John Campbell coming right up. Kia ora everyone, tonight the fallout from the catastrophic Grenfell Tower fire hits home as Auckland Council identifies 90 buildings of potential interest and finds two apartment blocks with combust combustible cladding. Auckland Council's Building Control General Manager joins us. It's revenue for the last quarter, $52 billion. We take you inside an Apple manufacturing plant, one of its subbies, which at its height had a work force of about 450,000. Also tonight, social service providers say a Queenstown newspaper's decision to name and shame drink drivers could do more harm than good. Prince Harry says no one wants the job. Peter Dunn rethinks Pike River. And Nelson students buy a coffee in Paris without leaving their class.
RNZ News at five. Good afternoon, I'm Anna Thomas. The Auckland Council doesn't know how many people are living in two high-rise buildings that have been identified as having combustible aluminium composite panels. The council has been checking buildings around the city to find out how many have the type of panel implicated in the Grenfell Tower blaze in London that claimed at least 79 lives. Its building control general manager Ian McCormick says the two high-rises are already in the process of being reclad due to weather tightness problems and the repairs will use fire rated cladding. He says the fire safety systems in the buildings are up to standard. All of the active and passive systems that exist in those buildings, uh, which are significant, uh, were put in place and are maintained and operated to make that building safe for the people that are in it. Ian McCormick says the council will be contacting the body corporates to tell them about the building issues. It will then be up to the body corporates to tell the occupants. Gaps in building records are hampering the search for high-rises with combustible panels. The Christchurch and Wellington City Councils have only just begun their checks. They say it could take months, partly because their records do not identify what products are in buildings in the way that's easily trackable. That's prompted the Christchurch Council to take stock of its record keeping. In Britain, local authorities are carrying out urgent checks on hundreds of tower blocks. Seven residential blocks have already been found to have cladding that could catch fire and panels are being removed from some tower blocks in North London. The Hobson's Pledge founder Don Brash says people who have made complaints of racism about a leaflet distributed by his group are misguided and their reaction is extreme. A pamphlet from the group and two others from a company that has published Don, uh, Dr Brash's uh, have been delivered together to letterboxes around the country, prompting angry social media users to post pictures of them being destroyed in novel ways. Complaints have also been made to the Human Rights Commission. But Dr Brash says his group's pamphlet, which argues for the abolition of the Waitangi Tribunal and some iwi rights, is not racist. Well, I think the people making complaints simply don't understand the issue. I mean, the pamphlet is simply saying, in recent years, the national government, which had promised equal citizenship loudly from opposition, has been betraying their position. Don Brash. The Primary Industries Ministry agrees with some farmers who are saying the size of the national dairy herd is near its limit. In 2012, the government set a target of doubling the value of primary exports, but Nathan Guy says there's no way dairy cow numbers can be doubled because of environmental constraints. He says regional councils will decide how many cows the land can support. The Canterbury Regional Council wants to introduce tougher rules to reduce pollution and some dairy farmers will have to have fewer cows. Mr Guy says he can't put a number on how many cows the country can take, but it's not many more. It's a lot more difficult now with climate change, with environmental constraints, to be able to increase the dairy herd by much. We've got an opportunity to extract more value and farmers and processors and exporters are continuing to focus on that. Nathan Guy, the Minister for Primary Industries. NetSafe says a new location sharing update on the popular social media app Snapchat can be dangerous for young people. Snap Map allows users to broadcast their location to their friends on the app. On its website, the company says users can opt to turn off sharing their location, but NetSafe's chief executive, Martin Cocker, says parents need to talk to children about this update. These services are, are a risk. They're a risk to, to child safety, but if you look at it more holistically, they're a popular service. Lots of people want to use them, including young people, uh, and, and so that you know we're going to see more and more of them. That, that's just the reality of what's happening. Martin Cocker says with apps increasingly offering location sharing services, it's not a matter of blocking them but using them wisely. The minimum age for Snapchat users is 13. It's four minutes past five. To sport, and the evidence suggests otherwise, but the British and Irish Lions coach Warren Gatlin maintains he wants to play an expansive game against the All Blacks in the first test in Auckland tomorrow. 
Typically, the Lions have played a structured game on the tour so far, dominated by scrums and mauls, and followed up with box kicks. Gatlin's picked a back line that has some attacking flair and says he wants to take the game to the All Blacks. Things that we've been working on in terms of our general stuff, in terms of our set piece, we think that's getting better and stronger from game to game. And now we just need to bring the other elements of the game, which is about flair, taking some risks and, and being courageous and bold. Warren Gatland. Joseph Parker's camp say they're some way off announcing the New Zealand heavyweight boxer's next bout. Britain's Huey Fury has confirmed he'll return to the ring in a fortnight and is still hopeful of fighting Parker for the WBO belt. The two were meant to meet in Auckland last month, but the bout was postponed. Fury's promoter maintains the English boxer will fight Parker later this year, but Parker's management company says that there are still a number of issues to be resolved before a fight can be confirmed. Rugby league star Jonathan Thurston's NRL season is over after being told he needs surgery on his injured right shoulder. It also means the 34-year-old's Queensland representative career comes to an end with the playmaker retiring from representative football at the end of the year. And that's the news. Social services cost billions, but how much of your privacy would you give up to ensure the money's well spent? In order to do social investment, you need really good data. You need to understand who needs what service at what time. I just needed to trust the people that were giving me support and be able to be completely honest and vulnerable with them. It's my story, it's not the government's story. I'm Teresa Cowie and Insight Investigates demands for information after the 8 o'clock news on Sunday morning with Wallace Chapman on RNZ National. Another short forecast from Met Service to midnight tomorrow. Northland, Auckland, Coromandel Peninsula showers. Some heavy turning to rain for a time tomorrow morning and showers becoming isolated later. Waikato to Taranaki, also the central high country, Bay of Plenty, Gisborne and Hawke's Bay. Periods of rain heavy at times. Possible thunderstorms in the Bay of Plenty today and Hawke's Bay tomorrow. Whanganui to Wellington, also wider up a Marlborough and Nelson rain at times. Buller and Westland, patchy rain north of Hokitika. Rain also developing in South Westland later tomorrow. For Canterbury and Otago, occasional rain mostly clearing tomorrow and becoming mainly fine. However, scattered rain developing in Otago tomorrow night. Southland and Fiordland mainly fine with high clouds. Rain in Fiordland from tomorrow afternoon and scattered rain in Southland from the evening. And for the Chatham Islands, rain heavy and possibly thundery tomorrow. North easterlies rising to gale. RNZ National, it is seven past five. Now it's time to have uh, John Campbell here and the checkpoint <laughs> right team. Beside you, Anna there Thomas. You go. Nice to have you back. Anna Thomas reading the news for the next couple of weeks while Katrina is taking a well in break. Coming up on the program, the Greens take on Nelson and therefore, I guess, Nick Smith. The Lions take on the All Blacks. A Queenstown newspaper takes on drink drivers. Harry takes on his own family. And two men risk a great deal to take on Apple by getting inside the Chinese factories that produce iPhones for them. Two fascinating interviews on that subject coming up in Checkpoint. But first, aluminium cladding. As London looks up at the scarred frame of Grenfell Tower, we're not far from some of the most expensive homes in Britain. Dozens of people burnt to death in a council apartment building with combustible cladding, no sprinklers and few, if any, working alarms. In cities everywhere, buildings with similar cladding are being checked. In Auckland, too, have been found. It's not certain if the cladding is identical, but the council says it's being replaced right now. That at least is known. What's less certain is how many other buildings may have that cladding. Some aluminium composite panels are combustible, some aren't. And risk can be reduced by what's beside those panels, and effective sprinkler systems, adequate alarms, effective fire escapes, and so on. In short, our largest city is doing a high-speed stock take to assess risk. The warnings that were sounded about Grenfell Tower were ignored and even silenced, but now no one can say they haven't been warned. Ian McCormick is Auckland Council's Building Control GM. We've got 90 buildings that we've identified that have an aluminium composite panel uh, on them. Which sounds frighteningly large, but, and this is a butt of mitigation. Some of that cladding system uh, is the, um, is the is fire-rated um, aluminium composite panel. And some don't. The obvious question now is how many of those 90 buildings have combustible panels? And that's what the council is now working to find out. OK, so there are 90 and you are checking each one? Yes, we are. 
building by building. Yes. Combustible panels are no longer acceptable from certain heights, but some do exist. You could have uh, combustible cladding uh, up to a height of 25 metres. That's about seven storeys and way too high for people to get safely out in a catastrophic fire. So... Um, now, if you've got a building that's um, over um, uh, seven metres in height, um, then it has to have um, non-combustible cladding. And for those wondering why up to seven metres is still acceptable, well, this isn't a one-size-fits-all exercise. New Zealand, for example, has hundreds of thousands of weatherboard homes. Wood is a combustible cladding. Still, in Auckland, there are an unknown number of buildings of heights that make escape difficult to impossible with very serious fire below with combustible cladding. How many? That's what the council's trying to find out. And when do you think that that might be achieved? <clears throat> well, we're, we'll be expecting to have this, uh, this review completed in probably the next three or four weeks. That's what, we're, that's what I'm sort of hoping for. Um, and that'll give, us a, that'll give us a good view um, at, at, that, at that time. So it shouldn't take us too long. Any time would appear too long in the context of Grenfell Tower, which burnt without the possibility of rescue for residents on its highest floors in a way that almost beggars belief in London in the 21st century. But Ian McCormick is adamant there is not a Grenfell Tower in Auckland. The combination of, of attributes of the building in London, um, as I understand it from the media reports and the other sources of information that I have, um, is not a combination that you will find in Auckland. And, and why not? So what well, happened in, in, in the Grenfell Tower that isn't happening in Auckland? OK, so, so my... So I, my understanding of that building is that, uh, it, first of all, it didn't have a sprinkler system. Um, second thing about it, um, it doesn't appear, there seems to have been some problems with the um, alarms and uh, smoke and fire detectors in that building. Um, it it's also seems to have had, um, um, uh, you know, it's obviously got the, uh, it's, it's, had, it's got a number of different features that um, you wouldn't find here. So, And, and, and is, like, sorry, forgive me for interrupting, yeah. but is that an absolutely categorical assurance? So what you were telling me is that there is no building in Auckland with the combination of no sprinkler systems and an adequate alarm system and comb combustible cladding. Uh, that's correct, of that height. At that height? Yes. And at a lower height, well, that's where things become less easy to enforce. If you live in a weatherboard home and you don't have sprinklers, you would absolutely fail fire safety tests for higher buildings. Height increases risk and therefore enforcement. I think it's really important to, um, to understand a couple of things, though. First of all, New Zealand has probably got the most robust um, fire safety regulatory framework in the world. Um, no, so that's very important. We've got more, um, 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 but the threshold for um, having to have sprinklers in a building is lower in New Zealand than any other country. Uh, we've got more sprinkled buildings in New Zealand proportionally than, uh, than any other country as well. So we, some fast safety uh, is something that we've, uh, you know, that we have done well. So I guess that's a really um, good thing to understand um, when we're actually, um, you know, we're confronted by something as appalling as this. Ian McCormick, so uh, a couple of takeaway points from that. Gosh, I'm sorry I used that phrase. Uh, combustible cladding was allowed in buildings up to 25 metres. It is now seven metres. Uh, we are told that the two buildings with combustible cladding of significant height in Auckland are currently being reclad. There is an unknown other number of buildings with combustible claddings, but the council will know that within three or four weeks and will directly respond as they discover those buildings. The same stock take is also taking place in Wellington and Christchurch. No buildings of problematic height have been found so far with combustible cladding there. Meanwhile in London, 600 tower blocks will be tested for flammable cladding following last week's Grenfell Tower fire. Bridget Burke reports. Picking off panels of cladding one by one, the British government has ordered tests on the cladding of 600 high-rise apartments across London in light of the Grenfell Tower fire. So far, at least 11 blocks of flats have been confirmed as having combustible cladding similar to Grenfell. A school next door to the tower with identical cladding remains closed. Claire Stanway lives in a nearby building. I was anxious and worried and nervous in the first place, and now knowing that, it's just, that it is the same, got, having confirmation that it is the same, I feel, I, don't know, I just feel like I don't want to live in here anymore, which is 
sad, really, because I've lived here since I was 18 months old. The catastrophic Grenfell Tower fire killed at least 79, including many children and, in some cases, entire families. Hundreds of others were left homeless. Camden Council leader Georgina Gould said the building checks would also include an overall view of fire safety and fire alarm drills in individual buildings. We thought we were dealing with reputable companies and we feel we feel let down um, and our tenants feel let down. My absolute priority is to make sure that our tenants feel safe. British Prime Minister Theresa May criticised for her initial response to the tragedy has announced 68 properties in a newly constructed block in Kensington, originally aimed at affluent home buyers, would now accommodate evacuees from Grenfell Tower. Turning to rehousing, Mr Speaker, 151 homes were destroyed in the fire, most in the tower itself, but also several in the immediate vicinity. All those who have lost their homes have been offered emergency hotel accommodation and all will be offered rehousing within three weeks. Already 164 suitable properties have been identified and they are being checked and made ready for people to move into. In the longer term, everyone whose home was destroyed will be guaranteed a new home on the same terms as the one they lost. 68 of those will be in a brand new low-rise block that has just been built by Barclay Homes. The developer has generously offered to turn over the entire block at cost price. Contractors are on site now, working 24-7 to speed up fit-out so that the first families can move in this summer. A public inquiry and a criminal investigation into the cause of the Grenfell Tower fire continue. The Checkpoint, Bridget Burke. It's 16 and a half past five. Thank you for being with us on Checkpoint. A teenager who went on an Auckland-wide crime spree that included carjacking an elderly woman and leaving her hospitalised with a broken nose and concussion has been jailed. Lily Pritchard-Davis laughed and waved to friends as she sat in the dock at the Auckland District Court today. The 18-year-old's lawyer arrived with a wad of 28 letters, one for each of her victims. Our Auckland Court reporter Edward Gay was there and is beside me in the studio. Edward, I remember this case very well because one of the victims was Nancy Voon, who was uh, a, a, a wonderful elderly woman whose family uh, we interviewed in the days after this attack. What um, was discussed in court today? Yeah, that's right. Nancy Voon, uh, the court heard, had just arrived at the Lagoon Leisure Centre and she was waiting in the car park when uh, Pritchard Davis and her friend pulled up in a stolen Honda. Pritchard Davis, Pritchard Davis's friend threatened Miss Voon with a, a screwdriver before pulling her from the car and punching her in the face and she was also kicked. She, she was in her 60s, uh, Miss Voon, and Pritchard Davis, she got into the driver's seat of Miss Voon's car and the pair drove off, leaving Miss Voon with broken teeth, a broken nose and severe concussion. Uh, Miss Voon has had to spend days in hospital after that attack. Uh, Pritchard Davis, she was on bail at the time after being drunk at a, a dumpling restaurant in Northcote where she punched the owner in the face and bit her on the thigh um, after being asked to leave. OK, uh, she was then on the run effectively, wasn't she? That's right, the police couldn't find her. She wasn't turning up to her court appearances. There were warrants out for her arrest. Uh, but Pritchard Davis, uh, the court heard, kept offending. Other charges that she was sentenced to today, they related to stealing cars, being part of a group that were carrying out ram raids on petrol stations on the North Shore and Te Aratu, and taking cigarettes and, uh, and, and tills. Uh, there was also a spate of smashing uh, glass shop fronts across Mangari and Onihanga, and uh, Pritchard Davis was also involved in a 40-minute chase by the police car well, chase. Well, they finally caught up with her though, right? Yeah, that's right. They, fi they finally caught up with her in a house in uh, Manurewa, uh, Pritchard Davis locked herself in the bathroom before being dragged out by the police. But even once they had her in handcuffs in the back of a patrol car, she, she leaned over and uh, bit a female police officer on the arm. Uh, a victim impact statement from this officer, she said that she thought uh, Pritchard Davis would take a chunk out of her arm and she had a nervous uh, three month wait while she waited for blood test results to come back. She, uh, Pritchard Davis later told police she wasn't worried about going to prison because that gave her notoriety with her mates. Judge Emma Aitken today said that, uh, there was an order for $40,000 in reparation. Uh, that included damage to the shop fronts, the stolen cigarettes, other property taken, uh, the damage to stolen cars used in the ram raids, but uh, Pritchard Davis has no way of paying. Pritchard Davis is 18, right, Eddie? That's right. And what do we know about her background? Because I suspect uh, that's going to inform 
and explain some of this, is it? it is, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a troubled background. I mean, Judge Aiken described it as less than ideal, but she's the eldest of seven children. Her mother has spent time in prison for the manslaughter of her youngest sister. Pritchard Davis herself was passed around uh, relatives before winding up in child, youth and family care. Uh, 11 different primary schools, dropped out of school at 15, ran away, she was lived on the streets, heavy drinking, meth addiction. Uh, it goes on, and her, her lawyer, Peter Dean, said his client was sorry for what she had done and was motivated to change. She She's tried to book into Odyssey House while she was out, and that fell through. Judge Aiken took time off uh, for Lily Pritchard Davis's early guilty pleas, her youth and remorse. Her sentence was uh, in sentence four years and two months. Edward Gay, thank you so much for telling us all about that. Our court reporter here in Auckland, Eddie Gay. The Greens are looking to oust National Cabinet Minister Nick Smith from his Nelson seat. The first time the party has campaigned to win an electorate seat in 18 years, the party announced today former journalist and Nelson City Councillor Matt Laurie would run a two ticks campaign in the Nelson electorate. It's not that the Greens don't stand candidates, it's that their concentration and campaign spending is on the party vote. But this election, Nelson is different. Here's our political reporter, May Heron. The Green Party often stands candidates in seats around the country and campaigns for a party vote. But it hasn't put money and effort into winning an electorate seat since its former co-leader, Jeanette Fitzsimons, won Coromandel in 1999 three years after Nick Smith first secured Nelson. In the last election, Dr Smith increased his majority to more than 7,500, so it will be a challenge for the Green Party to knock him off. But its candidate, two-term Nelson City Councillor, Matt Laurie, thinks he's up for it. They say a week is a long time in politics. Three years is an eternity, and um, I think the mood in Nelson's changed. Matt Laurie says Nelson voters want more action on housing, water quality and inequality. Plus, they'd like the local waterfront to be done up. In the 20 years that I've lived in Nelson, nothing has been done to make it safer or more inviting for pedestrians, cyclists, even motorists. And the reason for that is Nelson MP Nick Smith has this obsession with trying to build a, another motorway. Labor's candidate Rachel Boyack is less optimistic about their ability to dispatch Nick Smith at the election, saying it may take more time. I think we have to be realistic around the majority that he holds and that Nick has had a reputation in Nelson as being a hard-working local MP and we have to prove as Labor that that's the type of uh, campaign and type of uh, representation that we can offer. The Greens co-leader James Shaw says he's not concerned the party could split the vote on the left, saying both the Greens and Labor see it as good democratic competition. He says it's time for Nick Smith to go. Nick in many ways embodies the things that are kind of wrong with the National Party and the National Government. Uh, and I think that the opportunity here to move him on into his well-deserved retirement uh, is too good to pass up. However, the long-serving MP himself doesn't see the challenge from the Greens as being different to any other election. I thought every candidate that stood for Parliament did so with the objective of winning. I'm very committed to representing the wonderful community of Nelson and proud of record of getting results uh, for my community. Dr Smith, who's also the Minister for Building and Construction as well as the Environment, says he's not taking the votes for granted and he isn't focused on winning by a large margin. Oh, I stood for Parliament first as a very young man in the 1990s and I said then if I won by one I'd be happy and I say so again. The Green Party will keep their focus on Nelson by launching their election campaign in the city at the beginning of next month. From Parliament for Checkpoint, May Heron. Let's head from Nelson to Queenstown where social service providers say a local newspaper naming and shaming drink drivers on its front page could do more harm than good. The front page of yesterday's mountain scene lists 100 people who've been convicted of drink driving so far this year, 76 of them appearing before the court for at least the third time. Maya Burry has been looking at this for us. The paper's editor, David Williams, says the drink driving culture is at epidemic levels and ingrained in the town, with convictions in the area running ahead of national averages. David Williams says the convicted are a mix of tourists and locals. He says it has started a campaign to get people to think twice about getting behind the wheel after too many drinks. People know that drink driving happens in this town and obviously it's not enough of an issue that people have taken 
any hard or fast moves to try and stop it. And that's why we thought we could do something. We want people to talk about it. We want them to think about what they're doing. And most importantly, think about it if they've been out drinking, whether they want to take the risk of being on the front page later in the week. Mr Williams says the police are pleased with the campaign, which has attracted international media attention from The Guardian and the BBC. But not everyone in Queenstown is backing the paper's approach. Catherine Denniston is an addiction or substance abuse counsellor in the town. I get that there's a lot of anger from the community around this issue, and there should be, but I don't think the name and shame technique is an effective strategy in terms of putting people off. I think that it can be detrimental for people who do make a mistake, who get themselves in trouble, who pick themselves up and um, get their lives back together, and then you know anybody that Googles their name, that's the first thing that comes up. That's a message echoed by another local councillor, Mark, who only wanted to use his first name. He says the campaign could do more damage than good. The fact that you're isolating people and, and, and pushing them out by, by um, naming and shaming them just makes them more stressed, makes life harder for them, puts them at odds with, with other friends because they know what they've done. In a time when they need people to get close to them and believe in them and, and, and give them support... Jane Guy, the regional coordinator for Jigsaw, a family violence agency in Queenstown, says she's also disappointed by the campaign. We all want this to stop. We all don't want people to die because of this. But shame research has shown that it doesn't stop people from doing it. It usually either drives people underground to do it secretly um, or, it, as I said, it stops people accessing and standing up and saying, I need support around this issue. Ms Guy says the paper is creating divisions in the community which should be coming together to fight the problem. I think what would be helpful was things like allowing access to people getting home safely and breathalyzing people in bars, um, bars taking up more of the support role around what they can do to stop people doing this. But David Williams says the names of people convicted at the Queenstown District Court for drink driving were already being published in the newspaper before the campaign started. He says while those named may feel ashamed, it wants to stop others making the same mistakes. I'm not a researcher, but given the conversations I had yesterday, I'm hopeful it will work, that people will think twice. And obviously we're not just going to sit down... That's not the end of the campaign. So we've got other things up our sleeve. And it's a balanced campaign. Of course, people need support and they need care if they've got a problem. And we'll be reporting about those aspects of the campaign too. David Williams says it has not had any feedback from social service providers since yesterday's paper was published. He says anyone who is convicted of drink driving in the area this year can expect to find themselves on the front page. For Checkpoint, Maya Burry. Coming up to 28 past five, in comments which have taken royals' watches everywhere by surprise, Prince Harry has suggested that no one in the British royal family really wants to take on the throne. In a candid interview with Newsweek magazine, Prince Harry said it's all down to duty rather than desire. He also spoke about his distress during his mother's funeral. With more, here's the BBC's royal correspondent, Peter Hunt. It's a moment seared on the nation's psyche the funeral of a princess killed in her prime, her 12-year-old son on unforgiving display. 20 years on, Prince Harry is critical of those who put him there. And he's voiced his considerable discomfort in an American magazine. The enduring Diana fascination is global. My mother had just died and I had to walk a long way behind her coffin, surrounded by thousands of people watching me while millions more did on television. I don't think any child should be asked to do that under any circumstances. I don't think it would happen today. I think he has spent so much time hiding away from himself and his demons that now he's faced them and to a large extent conquered them. He feels more confident to be uh, optimistic, truthful and, and say how he feels. A monarch and three heirs, an hereditary system secure. Now Harry's suggesting that while the Windsors are selflessly focused on the greater good, none of them is desperate to be sovereign. Is there any one of the royal family who wants to be king or queen? I don't think so, he tells Newsweek, but we will carry out our duties at the right time. 
This interview will irritate Republicans who seek an elected head of state and upset some monarchists who believe that in return for a privileged palace life, like the one Harry enjoys here, royals should step up to the mark without a fuss. I don't think it's such a good idea to be quite so open. Uh, he has done uh, a lot for mental health in bringing out his own true feelings. But I think we've got to a point now where enough is enough. Wow, so you've got a full score. Harry's yeah, desperately well. seeking the increasingly unattainable, a relatively ordinary life. Inspired by his mother's example, the personable prince insists he's not completely cut off. Older royals, like Prince Philip, who left hospital this morning after treatment for an infection, know all about balancing the private and the public. They're a grandson and a grandfather who know about service, duty and occasional eyebrow-raising public utterances. Coming up on Checkpoint, we're going inside two of Apple's largest manufacturing plants. These are Chinese subcontractors who are involved in the production of iPhones. We talked to a journalist and author who's been inside one and a student who posed as a worker to go inside another. They are fascinating insights. One before six, one after six. Do stay with us. Peter Dunn rethinks his stance on Pike River. Sharon Brett Kelly's along with Business News and Nelson students experience buying a coffee in Paris without leaving the classroom. This is a Another wonderful New Zealand designed app. All of that and more coming up, but before any of it, Anna Thomas with the headlines. The Auckland Council won't name two high rise buildings that have been found to have combustible aluminium composite panels. It says the two high rises were already being reclad because of weather tightness problems and the repairs will use fire rated cladding. It says the fire safety systems in the buildings are up to standard. Don Brash says people who have made complaints of racism about a leaflet distributed by his group Hobson's Pledge are misguided and their reaction is extreme. Several pamphlets associated with Dr Brash have been delivered together around the country, prompting posts on social media of them being destroyed in novel ways. Complaints have also been made to the Human Rights Commission. But Dr Brash says his group's pamphlet, which argues for the abolition of the Waitangi Tribunal and some iwi rights, is not racist. The Minister for Primary Industries admits the size of the national dairy herd is near its limit. The government has set a target of doubling the value of primary exports, but Nathan Guy says there's no way dairy cow numbers can be doubled because of environmental constraints. He says regional councils will decide how many cows the land can support. NetSafe is warning the new location sharing update on the popular social media app Snapchat can be dangerous for young people because it allows users to broadcast their location to their friends. Users can opt to turn this off and go into ghost mode, but NetSafe says it's not a matter of blocking but making sure the update is used wisely. A Queenstown local newspaper has been told naming and shaming drink drivers on its front page will do more harm than good. The paper says it's to deter others from making the same mistake. But a family violence agency says it makes people act more secretively and puts them off getting help. And that's the news. Thanks so much, Anna. Let's turn to business news now with Sharon Brett Kelly beside me in the Auckland studio. If anyone's wondering where you are and is trying to track you down on an app, you're here. I'm here. Trim I'm right here, right now. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Restaurant Blant Brands is planning to list on the Australian Stock Exchange. It is, and this is to reflect the shifting focus of its business, it says. Now, Restaurant Brands, of course, KFC, they're both in Australia and New Zealand, Pizza Hut, Starbucks, and the burger chain Carl's Jr. Um, now it's been expanding in the in the past two years and it's got a, also got the KFC stores now in New South Wales. It's also got Pizza Hut and Taco Bell chains in Hawaii and other Pacific Islands. So it's saying it's going to apply for a listing this month and could be trading on the ASX by the end of September. It says it's been looking to list across the Tasman for quite some time and obviously that will enable it to get access to more uh, equity capital so that if it's on this uh, expansion in the expansion mode it enables it to go out and, and I yeah. guess 
by by and it, and it says that it is on a global it's got global growth ambitions so that means that it could have the it's got access to more money and i guess it gets it easy more easily if it's got this dual listing I can ask you, yes, it, it does. <laughs> I'm confused because KFC is a global brand, isn't it? Yeah. It's everywhere. Yeah, right? it so, is. So how does restaurant brands... So it, I, it I, only I, owns the business in, in New Zealand, Zealand and okay, in New okay. South Wales. I think right. it has 42 KFC shops, uh, stores, right. outlets in New South Wales. So I guess is it on? it's on a... On a franchise... A franchise buying spree. Mm -hmm. Okay, that makes sense. Thanks for explaining that to me. Uh, investor confidence in the property sector has slipped, our Sharon? It has, in both commercial and residential, and I guess that's no surprise. Um, but there's a growing feeling that the commercial market might be at its peak, and of course the residential market, uh, because of high interest rates, tighter lending rules, house, the house prices are they're still rising, but the, the, the pace of the rise is slowing. Um, and this is Collier's International's quarterly confidence survey, and this is a survey of investors, and it shows that optimism in the commercial property scene easing to a net 22%, just down from 24% in the first quarter, so not a huge drop, but 32% a year ago, so that's quite a drop. Yeah. And um, what else? And also, it's saying in the retail sector in Wellington, it's quite surprising. The drop has been from 17% right down to 5%, the lowest in two years. And that's despite the fact that there's uh, a record low retail va vacancies in Wellington. Gosh, okay. mm. Gosh, uh, on the residential front, confidential, uh, confidence has eased back to 32% of people thinking prices will keep rising. That's down from 41% in the last survey. And as I said, that's probably because of rising interest rates house price growth declining um, so yeah overall they're saying that there are no dramatic signs of weakening okay mm. uh, what happened on the markets today right. on the, the Friday the end of the week yeah end of the week uh, the NZX top 50 index closed down 10 points to 7554 New Zealand dollars at 72.7 US cents and 96.2 Australian Sharon Brick Kelly thanks so much Sharon have a fantastic weekend thank you John at the beginning of last month, Apple announced revenue for the second quarter ended April 1st of $52.9 billion. Their first quarter was an all-time record, $78.4 billion, all of which makes their shareholders very happy. But Brian Merchant and Dejan Zeng can tell you a little about where Apple's products come from. We'll meet Dejan later in the program. He worked at one of those factories to experience life firsthand. But first tonight, Brian Merchant, whose book, The One Device, The Secret History of the iPhone, published by Bantam Press, goes inside Foxconn's Longhua factory on the outskirts of the Chinese city Shenzhen. Foxconn is a major manufacturer of Apple products, and at its height, this factory was home to an estimated 450,000 workers. It's way larger than the population of Wellington. Most of them working migrants from elsewhere in China. They worked and they worked and in 2010 they ba began committing suicide or threatening to commit suicide as a kind of industrial action against the conditions there. It received global media coverage but Foxconn and Apple said the issues had been addressed. So Brian Merchant got smuggled in to see what life was like at the Foxconn factory and he found it was still dispiritingly, depressingly Grim. I mean, to me, that was the most the most difficult thing to hear. Uh, you know, uh, over here in the states, at least, um, back when the news of the suicide epidemic broke back in 2010 or so, it was a brief media sensation, and Apple came out and made these statements about how they were all over it. They were looking into it. They were going to fix it. So to find out seven years later. Uh, Firsthand, talking to these workers who make this device possible, every single smartphone, uh, iPhone that we have in our hands is made by hand by people who are working under these conditions that, it turns out, by and large, have not improved significantly since uh, that, that, out, that, uh, you know, that outrage. It, you know, and they said so themselves. They said, you know, the media coverage for a while drove improvement. They saw a small wage increase. They saw some, you know, uh, uh, benefits and protections uh, temporarily instated, but by and large, the dominant factors, the drivers that were really sort of 
causing all the misery are still in place. This really sort of oppressive management style where if you make a mistake uh, after, you know, throughout at any point during your 12 hour workday, standing on your on your feet, doing this repetitive task over and over hundreds of phones cycling through your station. And if you mess something up, it's a good possibility that your supervisor will have you stand up at the end of the day and they will publicly shame you for for making this mistake. Uh, it's an incredible amount of pressure by people who uh, on people who have traveled great distances, who are away from home, to sort of psychologically process this, uh, and a lot of them still cannot. You know, we don't see the same numbers as it, as before, sort of when when the headlines were made. But the truth is, is it just remains a real real issue and a and a real tragedy that there are any suicides at all in this these sort of corporate controlled factory city states. I'm quoting you to you. When I look back at the photos I snapped, I can't find one that has someone smiling in it. Yeah. Yeah. And I can't remember anyone smiling either. It, I mean, which is sort of remarkable given the size and the scale and how many people we did pass. And, you know, we weren't perhaps, uh, you know, the most ardent, uh, you know, documenters of the scene because we were so concerned at first at least with you know getting caught and making sure that uh, uh, that, that we were we, we were okay but but yeah I mean just all the the hordes of people I mean it, this place is all around work everything is uh, focused on work everything caters to, to this extreme work ethic and you know it's not just work maybe as we conceive of, of it it's it's relentless repetitive nonstop you know full days worth of worth of work um, and I, it, I, I couldn't help but sense that uh, it it was it was a deeply unpleasant thing you know it wasn't surprising that that most people only last a year there uh, it's designed with one thing in mind and that's maximum efficiency and squeezing out as many products uh, with the lowest bottom line as possible um, from from this skilled workforce so it's uh i guess i guess it's perhaps unsurprising that this is the the sort of place that you end up with can we extrapolate out and I, and i'm not sure i'm going to ask this question terribly well but i if you look at apple's rhetoric if you look at the kind of pioneering inspirational vision of its founders, if you look at the stories attached to it, if you look at the products and how sophisticated and attractive and appealing they are, is this kind of labor such a profound paradox that at some level it's almost grotesque? It's certainly, at the very least, deeply problematic. Um, I think the best way to explain the differences in the rhetoric and reality is the fact that it, that that rhetoric and that sort of talk sort of exists in, in a vacuum. And I don't think, you know, Steve Jobs really was ever all that concerned with the well-being of, of these factory workers. He may have made a, a brief statement or two, uh, but he was fairly glib about how he described it. You know, he's like, oh, you know, all, we're all over that. You know the suicide rate is actually higher in uh, in mainland China, so it's uh, really nothing to worry about. But I don't think he really ever gave too deep a thought to the fact that he uh, was, in a sense, responsible for the well-being of these people. Uh, his work orders were animating the entire operation at the time. Apple, you know, contracts Foxconn, sure, but Foxconn sort of lives and dies at Apple's whim, especially then when when it was uh, almost uh, completely reliant on, on, on Apple's business. It's more diverse now. But the, the fact is, is that they are too, or Apple would at least, you know, prefer that they remain perceived as two discrete realities, two separate realities. Um, and I think one of the great projects that we need to undertake both as you know, citizens of the world and, and consumers is sort of integrating into our vision of these products that we use the reality that they are forged by, by human labor. And oftentimes, uh, you know, 
deeply unpleasant and brutal human labor. So I think we need we need to sort of uh, you know do more to to push Apple to to do more. I guess is one way of putting it. It's Apple will be content to separate these stories and to ignore the stories as as long as it's convenient to do so. That's Brian Merchant. His book is The One Device. After six, we're going to talk to a young man who worked in one of these factories for some weeks and has described the experience of actually being a worker there. Obviously, we would love to talk to Apple about all of this. We've been after an interview with Apple for a very long time. They could also discuss the very high costs of doing business in New Zealand, meaning they, meaning they pay such little tax here. We're delighted to talk with any representative of Apple at any time. It's quarter to six. Thousands have attended the funeral for American student Otto Warmbier, whose tragic story has ratcheted up tensions between the US and North Korea and brought the brutality of the North Korean regime back into question. Although anyone who studied it probably never stopped asking those questions. The 22-year-old who'd spent 17 months in detention in North Korea died on Monday, just days after he was sent back to the US in a coma. What caused the severe brain damage which put him in the coma is unlikely to ever be known. But his family say they have no doubt he was subjected to brutal treatment. The service was held at his old school in Wyoming, Ohio, from where the BBC Ali Makbul reports. For many who knew him, his casket is the first they've seen of Otto Warmbier since he went to North Korea. He was arrested there early last year, jailed, and finally sent home to his parents in a coma to die just days later. In March 2016, Otto Warmbier was seen pleading for his freedom in a North Korean courtroom. Save this poor and innocent scapegoat. Instead, he was sentenced to 15 years hard labor in prison. He'd been accused of crimes against the country for allegedly taking a sign at the hotel he was staying at. He decided while traveling in China to take what was supposed to be a quick trip across the border with a tour group. Ready to throw it at me? Danny Gratton from Staffordshire was in the same tour group and had shared a room with Otto Warmbier in North Korea. He's left an indelible mark on me. He was such a lovely lad. And to think of such a young lad who's gone over on an adventure of a lifetime and his life's over. It's, it's hard for me to believe. I still find it very surreal, I still find it very upsetting. And I know I've spoken to a lot of people who went on the tour and we're all absolutely, absolutely devastated. North Korean officials now say Otto Warmbier had been in a coma for more than a year, claiming it was because he'd contracted botulism. American doctors say there's no evidence of that. Look at Otto, beautiful Otto. Went over there a healthy, wonderful boy. And you see how he came back. As this funeral takes place, there are now fears for three other American nationals also being detained in North Korea. Well, as people from his hometown say their final goodbyes to Otto Warmbier, there are people across this country who are asking how North Korea is now going to pay the price for what many see as the murder of an American citizen. That report from the BBC. Over the past few weeks and months, we've heard from the strongly polarised camps directly connected to Pike River. The families and their supporters, many of them mine experts, who say they want access to the mine. And the government and Solid Energy who strongly argue against human re-entry. Now, people listening could be forgiven for confusion. Same mine, such different takes on it. For United Futures, Peter Dunn, this confusion has now grown to disquiet. The more he hears, the less certain he is he actually knows what the right thing to do is. He's now calling for the government to step back from the fray somewhat and make sure all material about Pike River is in the public domain so that the best decision about what happens next can be made robustly in full view of all interested parties. In short, information is power for everyone involved in Pike. I'm someone who, when this awful tragedy first occurred, thought it was terrible, it was extremely unfortunate, etc., etc., but that it was probably unsafe to go back into the mine and, and the bodies were best left where they were to rest in peace in a permanent memorial. And I think most people were probably of that persuasion, hard and all as it might have been for the families. But as time has gone by, and it's now nearly seven years, and we haven't got any anywhere near a certainty or a sense of uh, conclusion, I think that, that basically it starts to gnaw at you that there's obviously got to be more to this and we, we are not getting the full story and therefore we can't 
eventually lay this issue to rest. And yet we have had a Royal Commission and the Minister and Solid Energy are saying, no, there is nothing new. Everything that needs to be known is known. Yes, and then we get the, the, like the release of the videos over recent weeks, which would tend to raise either two questions, either so that this material was known at the time and not made public, or secondly, this is fresh material that wasn't available to the Royal Commission and to others. And I think um, people can be forgiven for feeling a sense of confusion and a sense of unease that they aren't being told the full story. Now, it may well be that, that those concerns are unfounded, but until we get some mechanism for putting all the facts out there so that people can assess for themselves, I think those doubts are always going to remain. Is it fair of me to say that you have not strongly supported, for example, a human re-entry, people, mines rescue personnel going up the drift? Is that still your position? That's, that's been my position. It's still, I suppose, more my position than not. But as each day goes by and as each new revelation occurs, I, I do feel somewhat shaken in that view. I'm not as confident of it as I was three months ago, six months ago, 12 months ago. Now, I'm, I've got no direct interest or involvement in this issue. I've got no family connection or anything of that nature. So I just draw the conclusion that if someone like me who is quite detached is starting to feel uncertainty and anxiety, I can only but begin to imagine what those much more closely linked, including direct family members, must be feeling, the anguish, the uncertainty, I guess the mounting frustration and anger. And it seems to me that, you know, seven years on, this shouldn't be the case. Do you support re-entry then? It's hard to say at this stage. I think if, it's, if it is able to be done in a way that does not endanger human lives, absolutely. But again, I don't think we've got the information available to make that conclusive statement, and this is really part of the problem. While it, while it is held out there as being a possibility, people will cling to it. But if it can be clearly proven one way or the other, then it's part of the process of starting to get some finality on the matter. Peter Dunn, United Future Leader, talking to us earlier. A virtual reality foreign language learning tool is helping secondary school students visit countries and learn a language without leaving the classroom. It's called Immerse Me. It's an app. Its developer, Scott Cardwell, came up with the language program, which can be used either on a computer or a virtual headset and put students in a real-life environment in a foreign country. Now, as the parent of two teenage students, I watch them trying to learn languages from books, and I do think it's harder than it should be. The program is being trialled at 20 schools around the country, including Nelson Girls College, where the students have been helping Scott iron out any kinks before it's launched to the world. This afternoon, I spoke with Year 10 French student Alia Archer and Scott and began by asking Scott what he'd come up with. So we've created a virtual reality-based language learning tool. A and what does that mean for our older listeners and our older hosts? <laughs> well, basically, you get um, dropped into a scenario like a cafe in Paris, for example, and you, um, you can put it onto one of these um, headsets here or you can use it on a computer and you can immerse yourself in the cafe and actually order a coffee standing there in front of the, uh, the, the waiter. And do it in French, obviously, if you're in Paris. And do it in French, in the language. And you get all the help you need, you know, pronunciation-wise. There's a native speaker that, that tells you how to say the line. And there's translations there for you as well. And so we're really lucky that Nelson College for Girls have been um, testing this out for us so that every New Zealander now can, can use a really good tool. Right, so you're getting it into schools now, are you? You're managing to place it. Totally, yeah. The, you know, we had 20 schools sign up to be testers uh, when, when, we, when we presented this idea, actually at, at Nelson Girls last year at the New Zealand Language Teachers Conference. And they've all been using it um, over the last couple of months. And, um, yeah, now we're sort of ready for, for schools to try it out. And, and it's such a great idea because everyone knows you learn better when you're there, right? Now, you can't be there if you're a Nelson. But this way, in a way, you can, right? Totally, yeah. And, and I've got, you've got Alia sitting beside you, grinning up a storm. That's a magnificent <laughs> smile, Alia. Have you tried this thing out? I have, yeah. It's really good. It's so helpful, I think. Um, it and helps a lot. So, so are you good at languages? Do you find languages easy to learn? Um, not really, no. I think, no. I, I think everyone, no, I'm not the best, but... No, no, I remember being abysmal at French when, you're, when I was your age. So what, when you put this on, what happens? Does it make it easier? Do you feel more inclined to try harder? Does it make a difference? Um, I haven't tried um, this 
but I've, I've done it on the laptop and I think it does make a difference. It's so, it's much easier than, um, yeah, it's really good. And, you, and you, you talk and someone talks back, is that how it works? Yeah, well, if you, um, if it picks, it picks it up and if you say it correctly and, you know, quite clearly, then it, then they respond. It's really good, yeah. And, and what languages have you got? So you've got French and Japanese. Have you, are you doing other languages? Yeah, we've got nine so far, including English. So we've got um, five Western European languages, French, German, Spanish, Italian, Greek. Uh, and then we've also got Mandarin, Japanese and Indonesian, as well as English. Holy moly, that's clever, isn't it? So this is an app that is going to have widespread application. I guess Māori would be lovely too. Are you going to be able to do that? Well, funny you say that, John. I've actually just been talking about this morning. There's no one in the world that currently does speech recognition for Māori. We use that as an integral part of our program. But we've actually come up with the number eight wire approach, and we're going to test it out next week. And we're going to try and create it using Japanese. And because Japanese is phonetically is very similar, the, the vowel sounds are a, u, a, o. And so we're going to try and, um, under the hood, manipulate it so that if you speak Māori, it'll, it'll um, accept the equivalent Japanese um, word or phrase and it'll let you through. And, and in theory, it should work perfectly fine. Wow, that's <laughs> cool. Yeah, yeah. Actually, I, I've been struck by that in the past, how similar the vowel sounds are. That's very exciting. We'll get back to you on this. Alia, tell me, does this make a difference to how you learn? Are you more interested when you are able to engage in a virtual way compared to, say, book learning? Oh, yeah, totally. It's, so, it's more exciting and modern, and it's, uh, it's just really, I think it's a good way to... Um learn new language like it's, yeah it's, it's really helpful because this is all filmed actually in the country so we spent two months traveling around last year we went to paris and and so they get to learn you know introductions and things and greetings standing at the very base of the eiffel tower and then the next scenario they might be in a little um french boulangerie uh you know somewhere in paris and then they might be in berlin ordering a, a coffee and then in tokyo ordering uh, an, an obento box, for example. So it's all filmed in the in the in the country, and and we went and found real co real cafes, restaurants, bars, and things that were willing to be on camera, and and be a part of this this new educational tool. And so you know, it's really exciting to finally have it you know actually come to fruition and being used by these students. It's it's a it's a dream come true. Well, it sounds amazing. Congratulations. It does sound really impressive and beats the crap out of repeating Latin verbs which I was doing at your age, Alia, about 40 years ago. Alia, just before we go, what do you want to do when you leave school? Have you worked that out? Ah, uh, I've been asked this question so many times and I still, I still don't know. But... Sorry, well, it, it's the kind of question old people ask you, isn't it? But yeah. I, 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 do, I do find it exciting that you were part of a, of, a, of a learning revolution, really, that for the first time in history we're trying out stuff like this. Does it make it more easy for you to engage when you can learn this way? Oh, yeah. Oh, my gosh. Totally. Man. <laughs> like, yeah, so much. It's great. Yeah, it's really good. Alia Archer ending that uh, report from Nelson Girls High School. Lots of people there today, including the Mayor of Nelson, the principal, all turned up to welcome uh, that app into the school. Uh, let's stay at school. A group of schoolboys in Britain who've been sweltering in this week's heat wave. that's there, not here, obviously, have taken matters into their own hands and have staged a bare-legged revolution. With June temperatures the hottest since 1976, the boys from an academy in Exeter complained they wanted to swap their trousers for shorts. Fair enough. When they were told shorts weren't allowed under the school uniform policy, they turned up in school skirts instead. The BBC's John Kay went for a look. Around 30 boys wore skirts at Isker Academy today, borrowed from their sisters and their friends. What did it feel like to wear skirts? It feels really comfortable. Nice. Really nice. Yay! It's a protest. We want shorts! Yay! Shorts! Because they're not allowed to wear shorts even on hot summer days. They're fed up with long trousers and in a co-ed school, skirts are officially part of the uniform. Girls are allowed to wear skirts all year round. And they, they get cold legs and we have to sit there sweating. I think it's good if they can't wear shorts then they have to wear skirts. I don't think it's like them being told off for having hairy legs though. The head teacher wasn't available today. In a statement, she said she might allow shorts in future, but needs to consult parents. And she says the boys have not been disciplined for wearing skirts. There is an irony here because on the very day they've decided to step up their protest, the temperatures drop by 12 degrees and it's actually quite breezy. How long do you think you'll continue with this protest? As long as it takes, to be honest. What about in the winter when it gets really cold? I think we can bear that, to be honest. Like... Tights? Yeah, they can do. <laughs>
Until a final decision is made, the school says boys can loosen their ties in lessons. That report from the BBC coming up to six o'clock. Feedback. Hi, John. We're wondering if the Queenstown paper would name and shame the employers too. Most in hospitality who don't provide adequate accommodation for their workers, leaving them to drive many Ks or even live in the car. It's not OK to drive drunk, but more reasons may be involved. Thanks, says Fritz and Dorothea. Hi, John. Queenstown is a party town, so most of us usually have had a few. We will probably all end up having a turn on the front of the mountain scene. Cheers, says Mike. Gosh, Mike. Name and shame. Couldn't we look at the list of names as an alert to people in the community who need our help and support, says Diego from Auckland. Thank you. RNZ News at 6. Good evening, I'm Anna Thomas. The Auckland Council won't name two high-rise buildings that have been found to have a combustible type of aluminium composite panel. The council has been checking buildings around the city to find out how many have that particular panel, which has been implicated in London's Grenfell Tower blaze, which claimed at least 79 lives. Sarah Robson has more. The council's building control general manager, Ian McCormick, says the two high-rises were already in the process of being reclad due to weather tightness problems and the repairs will use fire-rated cladding. He says the fire safety systems in the buildings are up to standard. The council doesn't know how many people are living in the privately owned buildings, but Mr McCormick says the building's body corporates will be contacted. It will then be up to the body corporates to tell the occupants about the panels. Coursera Robson, Aho. In Britain, tests are being carried out on about 600 high-rise apartment blocks to see if they have the same combustible cladding used on Grenfell Tower. Already 11 buildings have failed the safety tests and panels are being removed from some tower blocks. Our London correspondent Ali Ollie Barrett reports. It's been widely speculated the cladding on Grenfell Tower may have caused the building to burn so quickly, leading to such huge loss of life. So British Prime Minister Theresa May has told the House of Commons it's an issue now being looked for elsewhere. I was informed that a number of these tests have come back as combustible. Results from more samples are due in the coming 48 hours and Downing Street says it will work with local authorities to ensure anyone living in a building found to be unsafe will be rehoused. Ollie Barrett, RNZ News, London. The government is vowing to vigorously oppose a legal challenge to new pest control laws. The national regulations were introduced this year to govern the use of 1080 poison and brodificum. The Brook Valley Community Group, based in Nelson, has taken court action saying the use of such toxins should be banned altogether. The Environment Minister Nick Smith says the challenge is a disingenuous stunt. He says native birds such as kiwi and kaka could die out without effective pest control. Dr Smith says the regulations were recommended by the Parliamentary Commissioner for the Environment and supported by the Royal Forest and Bird Protection Society. A social service provider in Queenstown says a local newspaper naming and shaming drink drivers on its front page will do more harm than good. Yesterday's mountain scene listed 100 people who have been convicted of drink driving since January. The paper says it will be publishing the names of anyone convicted of the crime in the area uh, on the front page for the rest of the year to deter others from making the same mistake. But the regional coordinator for Jigsaw, a family violence agency in Queenstown, Jane Guy, says that won't work. We all want this to stop, but shame research has shown that it doesn't stop people from doing it. It usually either drives people underground to do it secretly or it stops people accessing and standing up and saying, I need support around this issue. Jane Guy says the community should be working together to find a solution. NetSafe says a new location sharing update on the popular social media app Snapchat can be dangerous for young people. SnapMap allows users to broadcast their location to their friends on the app. On its website, the company says users can opt to turn off sharing their location. However, NetSafe's chief executive, Martin Cocker, says parents need to talk to children about this update because it poses a risk for young people. Mr Cocker says with location sharing apps becoming increasingly popular, it's not a matter of blocking them but making sure they're used wisely. The minimum age for Snapchat users is 13. 
Labour's Nelson candidate says it may take longer than this year's election to oust Nationals Nick Smith from his seat. The Green Party is to try to win the seat with a local city councillor, Matt Laurie. It's the first time the party will actively contest an electorate seat since Jeanette Fitzsimons retired from Coromandel in 2002. Nick Smith has held the Nelson seat for more than 20 years and in the last election increased his majority to over 7,000. Labour's Rachel Boyack is less optimistic about her party or the Greens winning in Nelson. I think we have to be realistic around the majority that he holds and that Nick has had a reputation in Nelson as being a hard-working local MP and we have to prove as Labour that that's the type of uh, campaign and type of uh, representation that we can offer. Labour candidate Rachel Boyack. Passwords belonging to British politicians, diplomats and senior police officers have reportedly been traded by Russian hackers. Security credentials belonging to tens of thousands of government officials, including a thousand British MPs and parliamentary staff, 7,000 police employees and more than a thousand foreign office staff have been sold or swapped on Russian-speaking hacking sites. Most of the passwords are said to have been comp uh, compromised in a 2012 hacking raid on the business social network LinkedIn when millions of users' details were stolen. It's at five past six. To sport and the All Blacks captain Karen Reid has been training without any problems for the past two weeks and says his repaired thumb will be able to stand the rigours of the first test against the British and Irish Lions tomorrow night. Reid broke his right thumb and had surgery almost two months ago and hasn't played since. However, the number eight says his lack of recent match play won't be a problem. Spot on, mate. It's feeling really good. So, handle a handshake and handle 80 minutes of footy, test footy. So, feeling great, you know, fresh, uh, bodies in, in good nick. So, kind of the emotions and uh, adrenaline will certainly kick in tomorrow. Really pumped for the, the test match. Can't wait to get into it. Garen Reid. It's not quite the dance of the desperates, but tonight's National Rugby League match between the Warriors and the Canterbury Bulldogs in Auckland certainly pits two of the lesser lights together. The Warriors sit 11th on the NRL ladder, with the Bulldogs just behind them in 12th spot. The Bulldogs beat the Warriors 24-12 in Dunedin earlier this season, but have managed just one win from their last five matches. The Warriors have won two of their last five matches, but their task tonight will be all the more difficult without injured playmaker Karen Foran. And the Northern Stars coach Julie Hornwig is leaving the new netball franchise after just a year and returning home to Australia. And that's the news. G'day, I'm Cosmo Kentish Barnes, and this week on Country Life, the tasty Taiwa is making a comeback. The potatoes that we're harvesting, the cultivar, the mould is called Fatoro, and one of our purposes is to grow great, healthy food for our children. And we're just beginning with our Taiwa, our Māori potato. For this and other rural stories from around New Zealand, tune in to Country Life. Friday night after the news at 9 and Saturday morning at 7 on RNZ National. And now the short forecast from Met Service to Midnight. Tomorrow, Northland, Auckland, Coromandel and... Um, other places. Other places. Other places. <laughs> yeah. And the general vicinity. <laughs> Showers, some heavy, turning to rain for a time tomorrow morning. Showers becoming isolated later. For the Waikato to Taranaki, also the central high country, Bay of Plenty, Gisborne and Hawke's Bay, periods of rain heavy at times, possible thunderstorms in the Bay of Plenty and Hawke's Bay tomorrow. Whanganui to Wellington also widened up in Marlborough and Nelson rain at times. Buller and Westland, patchy rain north of Hokitika, rain also developing in southwestern later tomorrow. For Canterbury and Otago, occasional rain mostly clearing tomorrow and becoming mainly fine. However, scattered rain developing in Otago tomorrow night. Southland and Fiordland, mainly fine with high cloud, rain in Fiordland from tomorrow afternoon and scattered rain in Southland from the evening. And for the Chatham Islands, rain heavy and possibly thundery tomorrow. Northeast Lee's rising to gale. RNZ National, it is nine minutes past six, and you're with John Campbell and Checkpoint. And Anna Thomas reading the news. Thanks, Anna. Um, have a wonderful weekend. Thank you, too.
A Labour Party campaign in turn has spoken out, denying accusations of poor treatment and saying they do not reflect the view of the majority of interns here for work experience. Now, it was revealed yesterday that up to 90 interns were being put up at an Auckland marae with complaints of substandard accommodation with cramped dormitory alcoves and unusable showers. The American intern spoke to Checkpoint a few minutes ago on condition of anonymity because the interns have signed non-disclosure agreements as part of their application. But she told Bridget Burke, while the program wasn't perfect, the interns have been well looked after. I thought it would be a really interesting experience to have, you know, get a little bit of an inside look about what politics is like, especially politics in a foreign country. So that's the main reason I came. Also, New Zealand is a beautiful country, so it's a great opportunity to travel as well. And what did you think you were going to do while you were here? Um... Pretty much exactly what we were doing. If you look at the fellowship, with the information sheet, that would be a lot of groundwork, um, phone work, meeting with MPs, working with MPs, planning events, et cetera, et cetera, which is pretty much exactly what we did. There's a feeling that the programme has been good but poorly executed. Um, I'm not going to say the program was perfectly organized because it certainly wasn't. There were a few issues in terms of just like organization and structure, but it wasn't something that couldn't be repaired. Um, it was a working process. It was a new program, you know, and the allegations of it being a sweatshop or slave labor are completely untrue. I had a really positive experience, and I know that most of the people that I am friends with here and are interning also had positive experiences as well. I mean, we were provided, like, great meals every single day. So I think the story brought up by a single disgruntled intern or maybe two or three more um, it happened about a couple of weeks ago. An intern stole two bottles of wine from Jenny Salisa's house and then um, had his leadership position revoked. And ever since then, he's been pretty angry and um, adamant on bringing the program down as well as putting the organizers. And this is something um, that's been very obvious to everyone. It's been a working process for the last two to three weeks. And he personally said that he was going to go to the media about two weeks ago. So does his feeling reflect the majority of students? No, it, it really doesn't. And that's what's been most frustrating um, in terms of the program. You know, I, so many of us have had positive experiences and it's been a very educational opportunity. And the fact that it's being painted in such a negative way is pretty disconcerting because that's not what our experience was. And the fact that the experience of two to three people who have a personal agenda is uh, what's really being pushed forward is pretty disappointing. So the program is no longer in place the way it was structured. So we are no longer able to all live together and work together and work in teams the way we were working, which was really an amazing opportunity. So yeah, I, I would do it again. And I'm pretty sad that the program is falling apart because I feel like that did not need to happen. And it was definitely you know salvageable. Um, and I think the most important thing is that the, the way that this is being portrayed in the media is pretty different than the way that we have experienced it and that it's not slave labor, it's not a sweatshop, it's nothing like that. And taking it that way is sort of belittling the concept of um, sort of larger issues like slave labor and sweatshops. So you got what you thought you were going to get when you came here? Yes, certainly. I'm, I, won't, I won't tell you that the program was absolutely perfect because no program really is. And sure, there were issues with organization, but none of that couldn't be remedied. And it's I think another thing that I've noticed in a lot of articles is that the Marae is being tainted pretty negatively, which is very disappointing because the Marae has been very welcoming and very kind to us. There's been a great, our living accommodations are great. I know a lot of articles focus on the single broken shower and the Marae, the single broken cupboard. Well, I assure you that all the other showers and the cupboards are functioning. The Marae is great and the staff has been very, very accommodating to us. Um, and we're very, very grateful to live where we do. And did Andrew Curtin ask you not to speak to media? No, no. Um, we signed NDAs, which is standard at the beginning of any campaign um, or campaign work. And so that's the reason a lot of us don't want to speak to the media, just because we did comply to a contract, and that's a contract that we should stick to. Um, and we really don't know what the, how the NDAs are being handled um, with this whole scandal going on. Um, but for the meantime, where we, we have signed on to NDAs, uh, we don't want to speak to our contracts. That's one of the interns talking to Bridget Burke over the phone uh, a very short time ago. Kiwi sports fans have a big old weekend ahead with Team New Zealand back on the water on Sunday morning our time. The All Blacks, of course, facing off 
in the first of their three tests against the British and Irish Lions tomorrow night at Eden Park. It will be captain Kieran Reid's first match since being sidelined with a fractured thumb back in April. Our excellent rugby reporter Joe Porter was at today's captain's run at Eden Park and I asked him how the All Blacks looked. They looked pretty good and they looked in good form. They also looked like they were having a lot of fun, did the All Blacks. Kieran Reid and Steve Hansen both had smiles on their faces and the team looked like they were really enjoying their work this afternoon. Kieran Reid, of course, he's a 98-test veteran, two away from becoming an All Black centurion. He's won two World Cups and countless individual honours. Of course, he wanted, we all wanted to know how big this match would be to him against the Lions and how it would rate compared to those other 98 tests. To be honest, it's, it's probably the most important right now for me. Um, yeah, massive one. I think the series has been built, has been pretty big, and uh, I think we've finally got to that point where both teams are pretty raring to go. Um, so I can't wait for the challenge. Um, you know, the whole history of the Lions is, isn't lost on us as All Blacks. We love the opportunity. You know, we've only got a certain number who get the opportunity to play, you know, probably in this part of our career. So, um, you know, awesome opportunity for us. Uh, yeah, can't wait to get into it. Joe, Karen Reid hasn't played for a long time and normally in such, uh, such circumstances he'd actually be given more time to rest and recuperate and recover and get fit again. But actually he has to play, doesn't he? That's right. He's their talisman. He's their captain. And of course, he hasn't played hardly any rugby this year, none since April. And he is coming into this absolutely underdone. He says himself he's fully fit and he's ready for 80 minutes of the most brutal test rugby you can imagine. However, I did ask him how the All Blacks would cope if the Lions and their suffocating defence were leading at half time or at the 60 minute mark. Would the All Blacks be able to switch their game plan and adjust to overcome this Lions rush defence? There's certain ways around, I guess, a rush defence, or whatever you want to call it. Um, you know, and I think it'll probably come down to the simple things done well. You know, the, looking after playing the rugby at the right end of the field is one. Um, and obviously our set piece is pretty crucial, so uh, making sure our line-out's spot on, um, we're scrumming well. Um, you know, it probably comes back to simple, you know, that's what rugby's about, you know, getting go forward, so that's all we look to do. Having not played in so long, and I guess being thrust into what could be an atmosphere like a World Cup final, is this the biggest personal challenge of your career? Um, oh, I don't know. Um, you know, for me, it's, and it's an exciting challenge. Um, I can't wait to get out there and, and be involved in uh, the series. Um, but yeah, as you said, I've been around the, the bush a, a, wee bit, a wee bit and a few games that have been right up there. So I certainly know what's coming. Um, you know, it's hard to prepare yourself exactly for what's, what it's going to be like. It'll be a different beast to World Cup finals and different uh, games that I've played in. So uh, you just got to adapt as quickly as you can. Um, and we've, we've learned that over our last few years as a team as well to, to adapt and adjust. And whatever gets thrown our way, we'll try and uh, overcome it. Uh, Joe, that is a reassuring answer. As an All Blacks fan, I'm delighted to hear Kieran Reid say that. Are you picking a score? Are you brave enough to pick a score uh, for tomorrow night? Yeah, I think I am. Look, I, this Lions side has improved a lot and we all know the style they're going to bring and it will be combative, combative, it'll be confronting and it will be very hard for the All Blacks to overcome. Don't get me wrong, this is going to be a real test match. However, the All Blacks have a lot of skills and they have a lot of confidence and I still think in that last 20 minutes with the impact of their bench, they'll run away with this game. I'm predicting the All Blacks 32 points, the Lions 18 or 20, so about 12 and over to the All Blacks. I stood on the bank at Rotorua on Saturday night with some Welshmen who really do think the Lions can do it. It's going to be a cracker of a game. Joe Porter from Eden Park there. The Auckland Council won't reveal which two high-rise buildings have been identified as having combustible aluminium composite panels because residents haven't yet been told. Councils have been checking buildings to find out how many have the type of panel implicated in the Grenfell Tower blaze in London that's claimed at least 79 lives. The two Auckland high-rises already in the process of being reclad due to weather tightness problems and the repairs will use fire-rated cladding. In Christchurch, the City Council expects the checks that's just begun will identify about 100 buildings with aluminium composite panels. Now remember, some of them are... Uh, not combustible. In the UK, authorities are now moving to test about 600 buildings across the country. So far, 11 have been found to have the combustible cladding, but that's expected to rise. Here's the ABC's James Glenday. From the Chalcot Estate in Camden in North London, residents who live in tower blocks could see the smoke from last week's Grenfell fire. And now they're furious and horrified to learn their homes also have combustible cladding. 
Yeah, it's all for show, mate. Um, you know, just to attract the rich, and it's all fire hazard waiting to happen. The blocks are different to Grenfell in that they have a non-combustible mineral fibre insulation behind the cladding, but all the residents weren't reassured. I won't be staying here for long. It's definitely made me want to move. Do you like the cladding? Uh, I mean, it's aesthetically pleasing, but he, after hearing what happened, like the fire, I'd rather live in an, an unappealing place than a fire hazard. Workmen have already begun the enormous task of removing the panels, which are designed to insulate buildings and make them more energy efficient. Until they're all gone, the Camden Council is conducting round-the-clock fire safety patrols. Spokeswoman Georgina Gould says the council was misled and is now seeking legal advice. We never felt the need to take off these panels, take them to an independent testing centre to watch them burn. We thought we were dealing with reputable companies and we feel, we feel let down um, and our tenants feel let down. But there are fears the problem could be widespread. Authorities are testing about 600 tower blocks across the United Kingdom. The Prime Minister, Theresa May, says affected residents will be told as soon as possible. And a statement will be made by the police and the fire uh, service within the next 48 hours. But even though precautions are being taken now, residents in North London are angry there wasn't better scrutiny before people died. Well, there are letters from the council to the residents trying to reassure us. Are you reassured? Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> Will you be reassured when they take the cladding off? Well, it's not just about the cladding, because there's no fire sprinkle system inside, and there's just one staircase. That's the only way to escape. There are some in the UK who claim the Grenfell Tower Inferno is a horrible symbol of inequality in Britain. And there's now a big push to ensure the disaster becomes a turning point in fire regulations and sees the standard of safety measures in social housing improve across the country. The ABC's James Glenday with that report. Coming up to 21 past six, we're returning now to Apple and to conditions in some of the factories that produce Apple products. Earlier in the program, we spoke to Brian Merchant, whose book, The One Device, The Secret History of the iPhone, goes inside Foxconn's factory, producing for Apple on the outskirts of the Chinese city of Shenzhen. It's a golden apple for shareholders at the moment. The fiscal quarter ended December 31st, saw an all-time record for quarterly revenue, $78 billion. Apple outsources much of its manufacturing to, and I quote, partners like Pegatron in China. On the outskirts of Shanghai, the Pegatron factory employs as many as 50,000 people to assemble iPhones. Dejian Zheng, a graduate student at New York University, spent last summer working undercover there. And what he found was the poorly paid drudgery that Apple tries so hard to persuade us is not the reality of working life in such factories. Why we choose this factory is that uh, we we kind of expecting a strike at the very beginning, because according to China Labor Watch, they has their research, we find that the wages of the workers in 2016 is actually much lower than what they got in 2015. That's because in 2016, Shanghai City raised their minimum wage law, so the factory had to raise the wages accordingly. But at the same time, they cut all the benefits, compensations, and like male stipends for the workers. That's why in the end, they get, they're getting less. So we see a huge wage cut there. And that's why I walk in and I want to see it might be have a strike. <clears throat> but that didn't happen in the end. So it turns out it's just me have a very interesting experience in the factory, make a lot of friends with workers, really know about their life and trying to reflect on how the global value chains works and what are the responsibility of those big friends on workers' condition. Can you tell me about the workers? Where are they from? Are they mostly migrant workers? Have they come from elsewhere in China? Yeah, so most of them are migrant workers, and they come from different areas all over the country, I would say. So, but I didn't see any workers that really come from local, like in Shanghai city. I didn't see any workers that uh, at least I know of that come from Shanghai. Some of them come from Guangdong, southern part of China. Some of them come from uh, Heilongjiang, the north part of China. And some of them come from Sichuan, the west of China. So they are basically everywhere. And then they are about my age. So um, a lot of them are 
their age from、um, 18 to 30. And most of my friends that I know in my assembly line, like who's sitting next to me or around me, they are like about 18s or 25 or 27, something like that. And for the most part, the work is repetitive, mind-numbingly boring. You have no say over overtime if overtime is required. You do it, and the thing that struck me from your accounts that I've read elsewhere is that in their downtime, a lot of these workers just want to sleep. Yeah. So、uh, it is pretty tiring working on the assembly line because we 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 stay in the in the in the factory for twelve hours. And we can we work for ten and a half hours in total, and we are sitting on the backless chair, and what we are doing is just simply fasten one screw. For me, it's fasten one screw over and over again for a whole day. So the the board like because the job is very boring, it puts you very sleepy, obviously. So, what is your conclusion about these labour practices? Firstly, a very quick question: Are they legal? I think it's legal. Okay. The、mm. next question then is: Are they moral? I don't think they're moral. Typically, typically on the overtime, when you are forced to do overtime, when you when you don't want to work on overtime, and they told you at the beginning that it's voluntary, but in practice it's not. I don't think that's moral. And so, when you see people like me, I have an iPhone. Using the iPhones, what do you want us to know about the conditions in which they are made? So, I personally don't think it is realistic to advocate for customer to don't buy the products. Even for myself, I still use Apple products <clears throat> like iPhones and MacBook. What I think the customers can do is listen to the story and be aware that there's a millions, thousands of workers, day and night, working like 24 hours in the factories, and trying to produce this kind of amazing electronic devices that we are using every single day. Just think about the iPhone that you're holding now. It might have been touched. By thousands of workers, their hands, and now it's in your hands. And I think it's very, very important for the customer to be aware of that and do more advocacy for them. Because when, from my experience on the same line, I can totally see that the factories are very care about Apple's opinions. Like every time when Apple comes to audit. Or Apple has some requirements on their, like they need to keep records on the training and stuff like that. They care about it a lot. So if customers can do more advocacy, repost it on social media and talk more about it, be more aware about it, and that Apple will care about it, a more positive change will happen in the factory. I think that's what、uh, I want to get on. Zhang Jing, who. Worked inside one of the factories. It's 27 minutes past six. Just before we go tonight, Auckland bars and restaurants are expecting tomorrow night to rival the revelry of the 2011 Rugby World Cup, as thousands of Lions fans have descended on the city. Some say they've been booked out for months. One bar around the corner from Eden Park says it took its first booking for tomorrow night two years ago. Mark Quinlivan went to find out what all the fuss is about. Lions! 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 The British and Irish Lions have arrived in Auckland, and so has the roar of their fans. There's no doubting they're hungry and thirsty, and not just for a win. Auckland bars, particularly those close to Eden Park, are bracing themselves for one of the busiest nights of the year. The Dominion Bar is just around the corner. Manager Michelle says she's calling in the reinforcements. Look, I mean, we'd usually staff,、um, you know, for an, an average test match,、um, we'd usually. Staff with about six. We're staffing with over twenty. Might even just staff with about five, and we're staffing with over twenty. And extra staffing isn't the only boost. We actually have hired a、um, a truck, a refrigerated truck, to sit in the car park because we can't fit everything in the keg fridges. Yeah, very significant amount of stock there.
The Dominion says some diehard Lions fans were so desperate to snag a bar stool and a pint or four, they booked well in advance. They're making a really big night of it and they were lucky enough to get in early and by that I mean a couple of years ago secure a deposit and actually hire out um, private spaces. So we do have a lot of Lions fans coming through the door. But it's not just bars around Eden Park expecting a gold rush. Colin Maguire manages Irish Bar O'Hagan's five kilometres away at Auckland's Viaduct. For us, it's a, we're, we're doing a four-day event, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. It's the busiest time since, I would say, the Rugby World Cup in 2011. New Zealand's hospitality seems to be paying off. By 10am this morning, Auckland bars were already seen heaving with Lions supporters. No, all good, all good. Very, very accommodating. No, it's been fantastic, mate. Everyone's really friendly. Very good so far, yeah. yeah. I, I was here 12 years ago and it's probably better than it was then. While many Lions supporters are quietly confident their side can secure a victory tomorrow night, some fervent teenage fans have other ideas. Who do you think's going to win tomorrow night? All Blacks! All Blacks! All Blacks! All Blacks! All Blacks! For Checkpoint, Mark Winliven. Quite excellent audio levels there. Thank you for being with us this week. On behalf of our wonderful team, Pip Keane, Catherine Woolbridge, Bridget Burke, Michelle Cox, Zach Fleming, Kelvin Samuel, Blair Stapel and Bradley White, we really appreciate your company. We hope you have a fantastic weekend and we'd love you to join us when we start the week at 5 o'clock on Monday night. RNZ News headlines at 6.30. The Auckland Council won't name the two high-rise buildings with combustible aluminium composite panels. The government is vowing to vigorously oppose a legal challenge to use the pest controller Brodificum. NetSafe is warning a new location sharing update on Snapchat can be dangerous for young people. A Queenstown newspaper has been told naming and shaming drink drivers on its front page will do more harm than good. And Arab states in conflict with Qatar have given the Gulf state a list of demands, including closing down Al Jazeera. Our next news and weather is at seven. What are the precious things that we keep in our lives? Specifically, this is E.T. He's lost all the paint from his eyes, has come off, and his nose is a little bit broken. My daughter, when she was born, she's 10 now. That was a lovely opportunity for me to hand this over to her. So I had to introduce her to the film, and I was watching the